Here's one towards the goal. That's going to be blocked by Travis Ridgen. Well, this is more like it. This is Slang in the Biscuit. Here's Travis Ridgen and Dave Wheeler. Welcome to the master class. This isn't even a full episode of Slang in the Biscuit. This is like a a a side project, if you will. This is like episode zero. This is like the um, the one point something. You know when you know when the, the Jackass movies like do Jackass uh, uh, three point five. This is like a point five episode. That's what this is. Yeah, I like it. We're broadcasting live from the Palomino Club in downtown Winnipeg. I don't know if you can hear the noise behind us, but... <laughs> the world-famous Palomino Club where you can get Booty Shake Mondays on Monday night. Yes, Booty Shake Mondays. My uh, my booty doesn't work because of my busted hip, but if it was, I'd be down there every Monday night if I was still in the city of Winnipeg. Now, just to give you an indication of what uh, what this episode is going to be, it's kind of a, a BTS, if you will, what uh, people in the industry call a behind-the-scenes look. Now, it's going to have some video clips in it if you're watching on the video and some audio clips as well. But um, I, I think me, as well as a lot of other people that uh, that ingest this podcast and um, on a regular basis, just kind of want to know because the day and age of the influencer and the day and age of the YouTuber, I'll give you a perfect example, and I've mentioned this on the show before, but... Back in my day, back, back back in my day, when we used to use pencils at our desks, um, we would draw pictures of like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we'd draw hockey players or firefighters or doctors. Nowadays, and talking to teachers that I know for age groups of like grades four, five, six, seven, you know what they're drawing? They're drawing YouTube. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a YouTuber. And that's great. You know, we can all have dreams. We can all have aspirations. But there's a little bit more to flicking on a camera going, What's up, everybody? Make sure you smash that like button. There's a lot more to it. I mean, the oh, the- I, I hate that so. Much. I, I want to like punch my face through the glass of my apartment when I hear people say, "Smash the like button if you really like it." If you're into that kind of stuff, and I'll see you next time. What's up, low gang? I hate that shit. Sorry for swearing. As somebody who has been a traditional broadcaster for 25 years, all the things that we were taught not to do when it comes to getting behind a microphone or getting in front of a camera is rearing its ugly head and has been a long time on YouTube. But the, the funny part is it's become kind of the norm, and that's why everyone has started doing it. But I, I, I think this is, could be a good lesson for any parents out there who has a kid be like, I'm going to be a YouTuber. Maybe put them in front of this uh, in front of the show. Maybe catch it on YouTube if you normally listen to the audio version. Um, put, on the, put, a, put on the YouTube version for them just so maybe they can get an idea of what it's like for, for Travis especially. I mean, me to a limited extent, but Travis especially on what the day in day out is of what a full-time professional hockey player does while supplementing his income doing YouTube and podcasting and all that other kind of stuff. Because I think you might actually be surprised at the amount of work and the amount of time that goes into the BTS of the entire thing. Yeah. I think too, like the full, full full-time professional hockey player thing is like a recent addition in the grand scheme of things. The full-time on YouTube, like you have to like really rewind back to like, like start from the beginning, like when I got my first YouTube AdSense paycheck, which was twenty bucks. By the way, I remember feeling like the richest man in the world. We'll get to that. In, it's in funny. A my first radio check was about the same thing. Twenty bucks. Yeah, about that. What'd you spend it on? I. It was funny. I wanted to frame it, but I couldn't afford the framing, so I just spent it. <laughs> I went. To, uh, I was living in downtown Winnipeg off of Sherbrooke Street, and Dave, I'm sure you know how uh, luxurious Sherbrooke Street can be. I remember getting well. that twenty bucks, and I walked right down to the Safeway uh, right next door. I ended up buying some uh, Nutella banana muffins. That's what I spent my first ever YouTube paycheck on. But um, but the, the day in day out is very interesting because um, depending on which way you want to see it, like I am a, a professional hockey athlete, right? But that exists because I think YouTube has allowed you know, allowed me these opportunities to fulfill that full time. But then on the other side, the YouTube full time and even the podcast to an extent do not exist without the hockey. Like if I just stopped playing hockey and I started working at Domino's Pizza, like no, nobody cares. So they go hand in hand, if you will. Um, and I, I would say yes and no. I think you, do, you you may have, you have the potential to lose a lot of the hockey audience, but you have the potential to pick up an audience of people who work retail jobs. I mean, I think it's more in the storytelling. And I think you do a really good job of that, especially on your vlogs, about your travel and whatnot. It's the storytelling that people enjoy. Case in point, you have 10 times more people watching the vlogs than you do the actual podcast. So you got your hardcore fans here as far as, you know, the ones that want to know the ins and outs of hockey. But I think your storytelling and your editing, which I want to get into a little bit later, is really where your talents shine for being a YouTube creator. I'm so happy you mentioned the storytelling part because that is the meat and potatoes, the glue that makes this train roll. It gets it in motion and it's what keeps it on the tracks because 
Um, I'm going to use this as an example, okay? Now, and I hope he doesn't mind me using this as, as an example. But our boy Nick the goalie, Nick Weston, right? You love his stuff. I don't know what Dave's doing, but <laughs> um, but so Nick is an amazing creator, right? He's got a million uh, followers on TikTok. He's got half a million on Instagram. He's got a quarter million on YouTube. He has all this incredible success. But one of the things that him and I talk about all the time is taking that following and that audience and monetizing it. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be working a full-time job and having that following, that that's fine if you want to do that. But you have to be able to monetize that to go full-time. If you know money's not coming in, unfortunately, this doesn't work. And I think that the story is truly the glue that ties everything together. Because when you boil it down, I'm not anything special. I'm not, you know, a Connor McDavid. I'm not some guy who's got God gifted talent. The only real, you know, God given talent that I have is that I was born big, born very large. I wasn't very athletic. I didn't have super hockey IQ. I didn't have any of these like incredible assets that other guys have. But I was big and I had a work ethic. And that is what really like my whole entire hockey career has been founded off of. And back to the storytelling side of it, I think that's what people buy into. I'm just like you. I'm no different than you. I've gone up levels. I've gone down levels. I've gone through probably a lot more hardships than good ships in, in my hockey career. But I never took no for an answer. I kept the nose down. I kept working because I love this. At the end of the day, like there's nothing on this earth I love doing more than getting in the six by four, getting in the cage, getting hit with some pucks, and working towards getting better. And I think one thing that people also confuse is, well, Travis is doing the videos for you know for money or for like he just enjoys making the videos more than hockey. I am incredibly driven by wanting to get better. Like there's not like this isn't goalless. Like that is my goal is to continue to get better, play at the highest level humanly possible, and we'll see where it goes. And that story right there of I'm working hard, I'm trying to do my best, I'm not perfect, I'm not the best out there, I'm gonna have a couple you know trips and falls along the way, but stick with me because my story is just like yours, is I think exactly what people buy into and is what allowed this to turn in full time. And to back it up, uh, I don't know if I ever told you the story, Dave, how exactly I got started on YouTube. Now, if you're like an original, original day one you know, follower of what I've done, uh, rewind back to 2011. I'm trying to find montages of my favorite NHL goalies on YouTube, couldn't find anything. The music either sucked or the clips weren't very good. So I said, whatever, I'll just make my own. So I'm downloading my own clips, finding my own music, editing together, and, and they were great. But after a while, I ended up running out of space on my parents' computer because we only like 40 gigabyte hard drive. So I ended up putting them on YouTube as like a storage, shall we say. And then I would just delete them and just leave them on YouTube and come back and watch them. But over time, people would continue watching them. And I think over about three years-ish, I gained about 7,000, maybe 8,000 subscribers. And I remember waking up one day thinking, okay, this is cool, but I want to help people. I think that there's a, a, a huge hole in the goalie market. I remember growing up, my dad had no previous knowledge of you know what goalie camps were good, what goaltending actually was, equipment to buy, all this kind of stuff. My dad fell for every single scam there was in the hockey goalie world. And I thought, okay, me now, right now at 18 years old, 19 years old, have experience that I can give to people in that same situation. It's not perfect, but it can help them not make mistakes. And so I wanted to do reviews because I felt every single review on YouTube or on the internet at that point in time was just a, a glorified commercial or a dumbed down commercial, if you will. So I started reaching out to every single company trying to find like, can I get some product? Can I get something to work with to help me make these videos? And the first ever company that said yes, the only company actually was Padskins, which is actually the company to this day that I print my custom sheath logos on my gear for, by the way, like that the original company, everybody told me no, everybody told me that this is stupid, it would never work. But Padskins, Mark Phillips gave me a, an opportunity. And that snowballed from there. And then the, the reviews kind of kept going on over time, you know, I'd add my voice to things, I'd add on ice uh, video, I'd add my face finally. And then I remember one day adding mic'd up audio, like adding the mic'd up audio on top of the ice to describe my equipment, uh, like my feelings towards it, the reviews. And then I ended up posting like an on ice mic'd up version of it. And that took off. And then that ended up kind of going into the junior hockey vlog, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, Dave. And that has evolved into the vlog, which has now evolved into everything it is today from the actual like pro hockey vlog in Motor City in Sweden to the goalie hacks tutorial videos, the, the same reviews that I was doing you know, seven, eight years ago that I, I still do to this day, like this glove, we'll get a review video, my skates, all this kind of stuff. Also the, the travel vlogs, which kind of, you know, deviates a little bit into the, the hardcore audience, which we talked about, but that has basically been the goal and the, and the mission. And along the ways, obviously the podcast has come up. It was a, you know, April of 2021 thing where at the time Pat Shea had his podcast and he was the, the previous co-host, Dave, he's playing in the, uh, 
uh, East Coast for the Maine Mariners, now up and down with the Providence Bruins as well. Um, and his podcast had kind of you know flopped a little bit, wasn't taken off, and we had talked and just said, why don't we, why don't we try this? I, I have ideas and assets I think I bring to the table. He has ideas and assets he brings to the table. Let's see where this goes. This could be a post-retirement thing if it takes off. And we saw a little bit of success over the year and a half we did it. Obviously, we had a little bit of a falling out, creative differences. And then, obviously, you know, Wheeler comes into the show April, or excuse me, uh, July of 2022, and that changed everything. You know, Dave's hockey knowledge, Dave's ability, most important, to keep this train and this OCD, borderline autistic brain <laughs> on the tracks at all times is what has helped make everything work, help bring the sponsors in from day one, keep them in, which is maybe the next thing we'll get into. But that's basically start to finish how I went from making NHL goalie montages on my computer to the vlog today where it puts up you know, 30, 40, 50,000 views a pop, especially during the season and the podcast as well. Well, it's amazing. There's a, few, there's a bunch of things I want to unpack on there, but I want to circle back first of all to what you just mentioned, which is creating those YouTube montage goalie things. You didn't realize it at the time. You just thought, oh man, I love goaltending so much and I love doing these little montages. You were training yourself to be a video editor. That's what you were doing. And, and, and you, were, you were clunky about it and that was basically your, your training session for, for editing video and being able to be comfortable enough with the washes and the wipes and the transitions and the music and the timing. And, and you were able to do that without putting yourself out there first. You used other content, which is really smart to do. So for anyone that's out there, start putting videos together of not you. Just get it, get editing ready because, unfortunately, not everyone can afford an editor. As somebody who professionally edits podcasts, and I've, I've, I think I'm throwing stones at about 2,000 podcasts that I've produced now over 30 or 40 different podcast titles uh, from many different spectrums of life, not just hockey or not just radio. But one of the big things that I think that you and I come together well on is you are a fan of radio. You grew up listening to radio. So in the back of your mind, you kind of have an idea of how it's supposed to flow, how, how an idea of a show is supposed to go. Like any good story, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But what I found once I got into the podcast realm, and this is not a flex, but I was one of the first people in the country to take a morning radio show, re, re, re post it as a, in a podcast form. Yeah. Repurpose it in a, in a podcast form. Thank you. And what I noticed was some of the habits that podcasters had in comparison to radio people. And when podcasting first came out, it was supposed to be the antithesis of what radio was. This was on demand. This was, you know, this is for you. You listen to when you want in private, whatever it may be. But they forgot about a lot of the good ideas that radio had and has been doing very successfully for over 100 years and decided to go their own direction. And in the same breath, there's a lot of things that radio are still doing that are not taking into account that people want out of the podcasting and bringing it into radio. So there's this still this kind of butting of heads between the two. And that's that's a really good thing that you and I have been able to recognize on both sides and why it's been able to form into this really nice version of storytelling through hockey and life and talking about coffee and whatnot. Now, in saying that, the easiest way to write a story is to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning of your story started with the junior hockey. Where it ends, you don't know. So you're literally writing the middle of the story as you go. Like we've, I have like, a rough we, idea where it's going to end, though. Sure, absolutely, but 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 the in between, all the details are kind of like in real time. For instance, like the expansion draft and where you're going next, and the places that you're going to go, and the, the things that the viewers are going to see, and trying to interpret that in, into a story in itself. All these little mini stories in the larger story altogether. So it's really intricate what you're doing, trying to create this narrative over the course of how many years to eventually, when it will come to its conclusion, how you get there is kind of like in real time. And I think that's one of the the benefits and the allure of people that are watching right now is what's going to happen next. Like you have in any good story. So people that are on YouTube, these creators, like kids that want to get into this, always remember you're telling a story and every story that you grew up watching or listening to or reading has a beginning, a middle and an end. A problem and a solution. I think if you really wanted to boil it down to like, what is the start? What's the middle and the end? Start somewhere. You have a problem. You overcome solution. The end. Right. And repeat over and over, right? And well, I think well, too, well, well, when you talk about problem and solution, that's a great point because a lot of times, I mean, the, the, the ether of the internet, there are so many. I mean, we're not the only hockey podcast out there. We would be ignorant to say that that we are. I mean, there are some people that, that live in that mindset of like, no, 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 
There's no other podcast that exists. We are the only ones. We want people here. We don't even want to tell them that there's other podcasts that exist, but, but they do. And the internet and people know that. So the idea is, is find something that somebody's not doing inside of that realm and do that. Give them something that they're not already getting. Well, like just to use the podcasting realm as an example, like looking at, at the mega giants and all the way down, look at Spit and Chicklets. Like they, they have built this mass empire with this barstool media machine, but at the same time, maybe their, their audio isn't the greatest. Their video quality is really bad. And they're a huge commercial podcast, but where we can improve on that is I have a radio engineer that I work with here who helps make the audio smooth and crisp. You have a meat stick here who's very good at video, specifically with the, the camera work, and maybe we got to get Dave a new camera sometime in the later on in this calendar year. But you put all that together in that this is a small two-guy mom and pop, if you will, uh, podcast. And that kind of you know fixes those holes that were there. And then you work your way down the line, and that's kind of where we slot in. And the vlog was no different, starting with the reviews of there's no real honest reviews of you know representing the people. And I think that's what really helped me get off and, and running off the ground was when I started the montages, I never had a goal of you know, trying to be an influencer. I never had a goal of even doing it full time. I just wanted to watch my favorite intro goalies and expand my computer hard drive stories. That's literally what it came down to. And then it over time evolved. I spent the time editing and practicing, putting in those, you know, uh, 10 videos, whatever it is to get better at editing, see my mistakes and go through. And if you even look today in the vlog, the on ice segments, the workout montages, the drone shots, everything works its way back to the original montage days because the whole vlog is an eight minute montage. And the formula actually, funny enough, comes from music, specifically in the Kurt Cobain Nirvana formula of loud, quiet, loud, quiet, bridge, loud, finish with the, uh, with the chorus to finish the song, right? Like the intro, nice and loud. We come in with the drone shot transition, talking piece, nice and quiet, back up to a transition, to a montage. Now we're getting loud again. Now we're going back to a talking piece, some type of bridge gap, and then we get loud to finish the video, and then the outro, and then we're out. And then also, this is more of a recent addition, following the TikTok format of nobody wants to see me ramble for eight minutes on a camera. We need 15 to 20, 30 second little uh, segments, shall we say, like a 45 second on ice montage, five second talk, five second drone shot, 10 seconds uh, action at the gym, maybe talking at home, cooking for 20, 30 seconds. And it just adds up together. The ads maybe are, are a little bit different because those are contractually obligated to be 45 seconds, a minute, two minutes, depending on the contract itself, which funny enough brings us to the presenting sponsor for this podcast, the team of Sheath Underwear. Yeah, well, let, let, let's get into Sheath real quick, and then I, I want to touch on monetization specifically, and I also want to talk on the uh, on the formula that, that that you just spoke about, and the fact that I'm really worried about society's attention span with all of these new social media platforms. But Sheath Underwear, I got to tell you a quick story about three, now three friends on, in, in the past week that I've turned on to Sheath Underwear. They finally got their packages in the mail. I shouldn't say finally, but they got their packages in the mail when they made the order and they used the uh, promo code BIZKIT69. That's B-I-Z-K-I-T-69 uh, at the checkout uh, when you do Sheath Underwear. They literally said, dude, I thought you were just overhyping this. I thought you were fanboying it. It really does change the, your, your entire wardrobe. It changes the way you carry yourself. It changes the way you you plan things. Like It, it, it is the best technology that men, as far as the underwear goes, can get when it comes to taking care of your junk. You can go to the website, sheathunderwear.com, and look at it for yourself. You look at it and go, huh, why did it take us so long? Like, I mean, you talk about meat sticks. How did it, how did it take us as males in this society to figure out that this actually works really well to take care of our junk? It blows my mind. I'm glad that they finally figured it out. Sheath underwear, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you can put Sheath Thunder up there with the invention of the condom and the submarine. They're pretty groundbreaking. They're pretty important. And it's why Sheath is the presenting sponsor for this podcast. Also, shout out to uh, Dylan Mimitz. He's a new member of the Patreon page, which is a $5 a month uh, page you can join to support the podcast. He and his missus got matching pairs of Sheath Thunder, and his hog is protected and all wrapped up both on and off the ice, but specifically with the uh, Sheath Thunder, their bamboo mesh, their cooling technology, and a dual pouch, which keeps you comfortable, cool separated, segregated on those hot summer days. I know it's the middle of summer right now. And uh, yeah, sheathunderwear.com on the uh, video version of the podcast is a link in the description, code Biscuit69, 20% off, and then on the uh, podcast and notes. I but challenge all the people. I challenge all the people that get matching skidoo jackets and whatnot. You got to now get matching sheath underwear too, just to kind of complete the other uh, relationship. Well, and you know, the sheath underwear ad is actually a great transitioning point because sponsors really are what make this whole realm go around. When I first, again, when I got that first YouTube paycheck for 20 bucks, I, I thought I was the richest man in the world. You know, I'm working 40, 45 hours a week in a kitchen, working the breakfast shift, playing junior hockey at the same time. And I just got an extra 20 bucks on top of the, you know, 14, 1500 bucks uh, a month I was getting. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'm so rich. This is amazing. Um, but then 
I, I had came up with the goal, uh, this crazy idea that I was like, I'm going to be full-time based off YouTube AdSense, like whether it's a podcast, a vlog, all this kind of stuff. And the reality is it is so unpredictable. It can go up 10,000% in one month and then drop right back down. You never know what you're going to pay. You're at the mercy of the advertisers, what YouTube is willing to give you. I mean, YouTube ultimately decides whether the video or the podcast is good or not, right? Uh, you can, mm -hmm. I can have the greatest idea, the greatest everything. If YouTube doesn't put it in the eyes and in, in front of the people, it's a terrible video, right? It's not going to get it. It's not going to go off. So realizing that the AdSense in my viewership performance was not going to dictate the full-time income. It had to come from the sponsors. And to bring it back, the story and getting people to buy into, let's say, my journey of, hey, I'm just like you. I'm not just speaking to a universal truth of, hey, if you want to get something, you, you can get there. It's going to take time and hard work, but not just in the hockey realm, in life, right? Like when have you, have you, tell me this, Dave, have you ever heard of somebody who said, you know what, I'm going to the gym five, six days a week. I'm putting in the time. I'm pushing myself. My diet's tight. I take care of myself. Good sleep, good rest. Over time, they have never not seen results. If you stick with it long enough, you're going to see the results. And I think that basically sums up my career. I haven't seen the results that I wanted, but I have seen progressive uh, steps to success and I'm just going to continue going right I, I think that's again, a really good that, that's a really good metric too to see they uh, as long as you're seeing growth because let me let me give you some quick stats here and, and keep in mind that 64% uh, of stats are made up on the spot but I actually checked these on uh, online hockey players around the world if you collectively put them all together in their minor hockey careers and whatnot they have a collectively a 1% chance of making the National Hockey League 1% okay if you plan on being a content creator for YouTube or whatever platform you choose, but YouTube specifically, you have a 0.29% of a chance of making over $100,000 a year. Okay? That's true. Now, does does $100,000, does that metric make you successful or not? No. Success comes in, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. But if you are seeing steady growth, that's a good thing, right? And if you work hard at it, that's good too. And I want to get into that part too as far as the hard work that goes behind it. It's more than just flicking on a, uh, a camera and the computer and yakking in. There are there are those anomalies. There are those anomalies that happen to make. But before we before we get to that though, I I just want to finish the the one point on the yeah, the sheet on where the the sponsors. Oh are. yeah, of course, of course. Be Sorry, because this is a very important part of, of this yep. formula. So people need to buy into the story, right? If you buy into the story, you're more likely to buy from the sponsors. If right, like a Logan Paul, I have nothing uh, about Logan Paul that resonates with me that makes me want to buy into his story or nothing. He's just some bum on the internet with, with a lot of viewers, not a lot of fans. So I, I never buy anything from him. But the people that I do buy from or buy products from are from the guys that respond to my Instagram message. I, I try to reply to every single person. If, I, if I've never not replied to you, I probably forgot or maybe I accidentally didn't hit send. So I apologize in advance. But it's personal. And it's, it's just like the, the concept of influencing, right? Like my mom would influence my decision on groceries. My girlfriend would as well. There's somebody that I know that I value. And if you can make it feel like you know somebody, although I'm just some bum on the internet that you watch every Sunday on this podcast, you're more likely to buy in. And that, if you buy in, you are selling the audience, I guess, in a sense, to the sponsors for a chance to monetize them. And if the people buy, the sponsors come back. And as soon as the people stop buying, the sponsors go away and they spend their advertising dollars somewhere else where they're going to get a better return, which is why it's so important that you buy a pair of sheath underwear to keep this podcast going and the vlog as well. But that is the base of the formula that enabled me to go full-time. And also, so when I went full-time, shall we say, and full-time is different for everybody. Like some people like to spend fruit or uh, lavishly. They need three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month. Uh, I, like, I like to think that I live pretty humbly for the most part. Like I, I buy chicken thighs at the grocery store all the time. Probably one of the best hidden gems you can buy. Like just the absolute bare necessities is what I can get by on. And so when I was trying to get over that hump where I'm like, okay, I'm making good part-time money, but this isn't full-time. I need something to get me over that hump. So I did five videos every single week. I remember for like two, two and a half months. And it, I was absolutely burnt out by the end of it because it's just so much work to crank out these videos. But after that, I took a little bit of a break. And then like we're not talking like months, we're talking like a couple weeks of just like one or two videos. But then I went a, a year and a half, 18 months of doing three videos every single week, every single Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There was, I think, a one, maybe a two-week period in there where I only did like two videos a week, but the three videos a week for a year and a half. And that was what grew the vlog, got it to be you know full-time, have the sponsors come on, people to, to trust it and the sponsors to trust it as well. And that ultimately, I guess, enable a, a full-time income where you know, working on the vlog is my full-time job. It gave me time to, you know, put aside the vlog and then build the podcast up. And it's going very, you know, smooth with Dave and I so far. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it stays that way. And, <laughs> you jinxed uh, it. Yeah. You bloody jinxed it. 
Well, we uh, what did we do? I think we did fifty seven episodes on the, or fifty nine episodes on the previous version of the podcast, and we are at forty f- something. We're, so, we're, we're, we're somewhere in the the forties or fifties, yeah. Yeah, so we're coming up very close to surpassing the old version of the podcast, but that's basically uh, my point on on the buying the story and into the sponsors. So back to what you were saying, Dave. Well, uh, no, but listen, I, I mean, let's let's stay on the monetization for a second because that's really important. Because I mean, if you if you do want to be a YouTube creator, you have to make sure it's sustainable for your for your pocket. You got to make sure that you're bringing in the dollars. So there there's a few different ways to do that. Obviously, through through crowdfunding, you know, places like Patreon, which which we use. There's Places like YouTube ads, which you can sign up for, which, uh, you know, can be a little daunting for somebody who's uh, just getting in and having to click all these things. And are you clicking the right ones? And are you using original material? Are you using any outside sources? Like all these things really matter. Like if you use a clip that's longer than X amount of time, then you have to pay royalties. Or if you're using an image or you're using music, like these are all things that YouTube specifically, since, since we're talking about that platform, is very uh, liable for, uh, for, for using someone else's, um, uh, mental creativity, right? Like I go, I, I, if somebody decided to take five minutes of audio from this podcast and use it and start making money on it, they would owe us money. Luckily we're not running into that situation right now, but when it comes to monetization, I hope we do. That'd be a great problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We should put a disclaimer at the beginning and ending of all these, you cannot use without our permission, but a perfect example, going back to to radio or television, where do they get their money from? By running ads, blocks of ads, five you know five at a time sometimes, two and a half to uh, three minutes of ads in between these segments that run, and they are very scheduled. You get a twenty two minute episode of your favorite television show, and then there's eight minutes of commercials to but hold on by that half hour. Victoria and I were talking about this exactly a couple of days ago. The difference between influencer ads and TV or radio ads is we have if I'm radio or TV. Here are the slots. The highest bidder gets them. We don't care who. We, you know, we can have five car companies all competing for the same audience. You can pay. You can get it. And nobody really holds you to account, right? So, for example, uh, if Connor McDavid is drinking BioSteel one day and then he's drinking Gatorade the next day, no, nobody really bats an eye. They're just, oh, he's drinking, you know, whatever. But... In, in my case, being the, the influencer, I, and I hate that word. It's such a, a cringy buzzword, I, I think. I, I, I prefer creator. You are, you are a creator. content creator. Fil- I, I like filmmaker because I, I do think that I make films for a living on, on YouTube or you know, podcaster as well. But the, the reality is that I can't just sell the, you know, to the highest bidder. It has to be something that I believe in so I know that people are actually going to like it and so that when you buy it, you're going to say, you know what, I like this, like the sheath underwear. It's great. It's fantastic. And then you're going to buy again. You're going to continue that trust. There is no faster way to kill a relationship with somebody who watches the vlog, watches the podcast, whatever. If they, let's say, let's say, for example, they buy a pair of sheath underwear, they get it. There's no dual pouch. It's just a, a trash piece of uh, Hanes or Fruit of Loom underwear that I, I waste my money. I thought I trusted this guy. Now I don't. And they never buy again. They never watch again. That is the quickest way to burn out your career is doing that. And actually, funny enough, one of the things, one of the, the genius ideas I had, if you want to call it that, and, and I'm using that sarcastically if you're on the video version of the podcast, genius, uh, early on was what if I get sponsors with hockey equipment companies, they send me gear for free, I use the gear, make videos on it, make money on the videos, put sponsors on the videos, and then I flip the gear for money. And I thought, this is great. There's zero cost to it. It's just all straight profit. And then I remember realizing the first you know big chunk of free gear that I got was uh, Bauer Goalie. They sent me $7,000 of free gear. They sent me two full uh, sets of the original 1S gear, extra gloves, all this kind of stuff. And I remember along the way, they were telling me, hey, so I got these new skates from this company. We don't want you posting about this. We want you posting this. Don't say this. Don't say that. And there's so many requirements. I remember, you know, fighting with, with one of the reps. Uh, and this guy was just such a nerd. He's just such a dork. Sorry for, for name calling here. But um, I remember one day he texted me. He's like, hey, saw the glove is kind of breaking down. Why don't you send the stuff back? We'll get you a new set on the way. I said, sure. You know, you've already got me two sets. What's a third? The guy took the gear back and then just effed off. Never texted me back. I uh, never got the gear back, never got a replacement. So that's the reality of, of the hockey industry. Another example, too, is, you know, the guys are true. They, I remember they sent me, you know, two sets of uh, free custom skates. Had a million issues under the sun. I remember giving them feedback and them saying, well, we don't really care. We just need you to post. Can you post this? Can you post that? Can you drive sales? I'm like, well, I'm not driving sales. The product sucks. That's the problem. Your, your money focus is opposed to actually making a good product. Even the guys at uh, Lefebvre, who then ended up getting bought out by True, was a great mom and pop uh, foundation, great mom and pop family uh, company that really cared. I felt about me and about making a really good product. Bought out by True. Now they don't care. It's you. You say this, you do that. This is the way that it's going to be. Yeah, I'm. I, I, start- I, I'm. 
Yeah, you, you you bring up excellent points, but at the same time, I mean, they're giving they're they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it. They are doing it to drive sales, and they expect that, like you said. And always keep this in mind: if you ever want to be a YouTube creator or a TikToker or whatever you want to call it, it's show business, not show friends. It is show business, and when it comes down to the almighty dollar, that is what matters most to your your advertisers. That's all they care about. Are they, are they getting a return on their investment? If their ROI is good, they'll stick around. The second it goes down, they gone. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because whether it's you know companies like Sheath or, or any of the other sponsors we have, they will take their dollars elsewhere to advertise if they don't see a return. And the companies like the Bowers and the Trues and all that kind of stuff, there is no free product. There's no free anything. They want something in return, right? And I, and I learned that very quickly. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, again, I, I just wanted to, I want to make sure I touch on this, but it's scary to me to think that we have gone from long form podcasting, which was, you know, the thing down to 20 to 40 second TikTok clips that you just scroll through aimlessly. And the odd time you'll see an ad and the odd time it's like, hey, you get a bonus if you watch this ad. OK, I'll watch this ad. You click through and it's just it's becoming it's becoming soulless. And then so I do appreciate much more like the good old days of when radio and television first came out. The presenter, as they would call them back then, would be like, and now a moment from our sponsor. Hello and welcome. I would like to tell you about sheath underwear to be the same person kind of giving you the pitch rather than these really slick ads that are put together. And there's nothing wrong with those. I think that those do a really good job too. But our attention spans are so diluted that it's scary sometimes that I, I don't think sometimes, especially the younger generation can tell the difference between content and an ad. I, I couldn't agree more. I think there is though a magical place of that, that short form TikTok, Instagram stuff. It's so hard to build that connection. It's so hard to, to get you to buy into a story within, you know, I, I wouldn't even say 20 to 30 seconds. I'd say you have about two to five seconds to get somebody to buy and they're gone as opposed to YouTube. You know, you put it on an eight minute video and, and we'll get to why the videos or why the vlogs are eight minutes in a second. But like that's the ultimate way to, to build that uh, camaraderie and that trust in the audience. And so the reason that the vlog is eight minutes all the time, there's a couple of thoughts that go into my mind. Obviously that, that loud, quiet, loud format that I mentioned of you know, building the tension up, giving you a lot of action, then maybe some talking and, and whatnot. But also styling it after a, you know TikToks basically. It's twenty to thirty second TikToks formatted in long version for YouTube, comprised together in transition with drone shots, music, all this cinematography, and packed together in an eight minute package. Usually no more than eight minutes and thirty seconds. I like to keep between eight and eight thirty because so YouTube has double ads, right? And so if your video is seven minutes and fifty nine seconds or shorter, you get one ad. That's it. That's all they will the, they're willing to pay you for. If you do eight minutes or longer, they'll give you double, sometimes triple ads. So you're getting significantly uh, more money being paid for the ads that you put in the video. So my thought process is the payoff of only getting the one ad for like a five to six minute video is not worth it compared to an eight. But I want to keep the videos as short as humanly possible so people aren't having to sit through a 10, 12, 15, 20 minute video because people don't have that, that much time anymore, right? The attention spans have been destroyed by TikTok and Instagram and these short form content. So keeping it eight minutes is that happy medium. It's the shortest video that I can deliver to you with the most amount of upside to keep the business going financially. And that I guess is basically where the, the whole uh, the formula comes from. And I think you also got to look into the, the editing. Like we mentioned before, it is the old montage days repackaging into vlog programming. You know, you add the, you know, the drone shots, which are just the transitional pieces to get you from one segment to the other, which again, that's, that's all hundred percent self-taught. I just bought a drone one day, crashed it a million times and just got better and better until I finally stopped crashing it. And here we are. Uh, actually I'll put a video on the video version of the podcast. I mean, crashing a drone. I'm, I'm on the ice skating at an outdoor rink and I had the drone maybe sitting over top of some trees and then I forgot the battery was going to die. And then all of a sudden the drone's coming down, I'm going to crash in the trees. And right before it hits the trees, you see me in my gear, throw my gloves off and go running and try and go and grab it. But obviously it's, it's too late. It's pretty, it's pretty good if you're on the video version of the podcast. You'll just have to take my word for it on the audio version. But yeah, well, let's, there's uh, that. <laughs> hey, well, let, let, let's go over some of the costs that are, uh, that accrue with doing something like that. Like what did your drone cost you? Are you comfortable talking about that? Yeah. Uh, so the drone I have is a mini three pro, uh, and it's got the smart controller. So it's about 1500 Canadian, 1600 Canadian by the time you're all said and done. Not cheap. And what about your microphone? What did that cost you? Uh, this puppy was 200 bucks, I think 150. And then the, the camera that we record the video version of the podcast for. And then also, uh, I changed some of the settings on it and do B-roll for the vlog. So like if you see uh, like a time lapse, you see like a well specific time lapses, you see cinematic shots. It's coming from this camera right here. And that whole setup was 2,500, almost three grand for the you know camera and the, the tripod. 
my uh, my phone actually is one that probably in the last two years I've started using all the time. You know, you get the wide shots, the beautiful shots, the slow mo, the time lapses, works great. Um, and then obviously the on ice uh, action cameras help for you know having a camera on the ice that can actually tolerate being beaten up. But obviously that cost cash as well but i think the biggest investment is is like the laptop like my laptop right now the one that you know we record everything on and edit everything on is a macbook pro from 2020 and it's just even though it's three years old it's getting so slow and so outdated like it's not able to cap catch up with what i actually need to do editing wise with the transitions the the layers on the actual edit the 4k the 5k all this all these types of things like to like the podcast when we like when i export it and upload it so it ends up being like a 200 300 gigabyte master file but it takes about three, three and a half hours, sometimes four, just to from export to here's your finished file. Like it's it's slow, and that's the biggest cost. Like to get a, a decent computer that can actually do this stuff is four or five thousand dollars on the the cheaper end, if you want to call it that. So like there's a lot of there's a lot of cost, the ice time, the the equipment. Which I'm very lucky that um, I guess you could say I had the influence that I have where people send me codes. Like I just bought a bunch of uh, brand new uh, True, oh sorry, Lefave sheath. Uh, 12.2 and 20.2 gear at 65% off from the the true affiliate uh, influencer pro, or not influencer um, employee creator program. program. Okay, create uh, not the creator. Yeah, the uh, the employee program. So I get 65% off. So I bought like six thousand dollars worth of gear for like two grand. I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna use it. Make videos on it and then flip it for uh, for a profit. Right, and that's another part of the business. Like in the summer when the vlog gets quiet and the podcast gets quiet, like buying and flipping gear and doing reviews is is probably the biggest way that I make money during the summer. Simply put. Now, you said you use lav mics as well. For those who don't know, those are like the little lapel pins, little lav mics. You use those for on the ice as well. What do those run you? Um, so I, I use the Rode uh, Wireless Go. It's about a $200 setup, and then the lav mics probably another 20 or 30 bucks. And that I, I use sometimes for like the on ice um, uh, stuff, like where I'm mic'd up, or like sometimes like if I'm sitting up, setting up with the camera talking outdoors with a, a zoom on the lens so I can get decent audio without sounding distorted. Obviously, this is the, the voiceover mic or the podcasting mic, but that's basically everything that goes into giving you a finished final product. Oh, and we haven't even talked about software yet. What do you use for software for your video editing and your audio editing? Final Cut Pro for the video side of things, and then, uh, believe it or not, GarageBand for the audio. So this is all recorded in GarageBand. Everything's brought into Final Cut, and that's where the video and the audio version of the podcast get produced, and then the uh, the audio for the vlog and the vlog itself gets produced in Final Cut. All right, so uh, I use uh, Adobe, uh, their Adobe program. So Adobe Audition is the audio editing program and Adobe Premiere is the video editing and I get the whole Adobe package in the Adobe Cloud and I, my wife takes more of the, uh, takes care of more of the financials, but I think that costs just close to $1,000 a year for all that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a cost that uh, a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, you're gonna have to edit your stuff. And I, there's a lot of free programs out there like, uh, we use Zoom to make sure that we're both on uh, on point for the for the studio here. Um, there's a, there's OBS, which is a um, a direct if you want to do a lot. Like th there are so many options out there, and some of them are cost effective, some of them aren't. But it, in order to cut through the clutter, which is a word we use a lot in, in the industry, to cut through the clutter from everyone else that's doing stuff, sometimes it takes money to do that. And in order to do that, you either have to make an investment, find an investor, or make your own money so you can invest into yourself. The ultimate clutter cutter is the team at Manscaped.com, the next sponsor for this podcast with the brand new Beard Hedger Beard Trimmer from Manscaped.com. Now, here's the deal. If you have a beard like me, I have the um, crimson chin look that I'm kind of going for the tapered jawline. Dave has got a nice beard as well. And we both use the Manscaped Beard Hedger and Beard Trimmer. It's got 10 different lengths. It's even got a half point length. So if you want to really sum it up, it's got about 20. It's waterproof. It's a beast. It goes right down to the wood. Get that length from the team at Manscaped.com. It is great. Uh, and you can go to the link in the video description at manscaped.com. You're going to use the code BISKIT, B-I-Z-K-I-T, no 69, just B-I-Z-K-I-T. Again, that'll get you 20% off and free shipping. If you're on the Apple or the Spotify version, you can hear me, but pull over in the car when it's safe to do so or when you're done your set of bench press or squats at the gym. And the podcast notes, same thing. Click on that Manscaped link and the code BISKIT will get you 20% off and free shipping the best uh, beard trimmer that uh, money can buy, only from the team at Manscaped. So, they got a yeah. lot of other great products too. I got some really good ones. I like the deodorant, actually. It kind of smells like, um, uh, not lavender, uh, licorice, like the anise. I, I like that. The missus likes that, too, when I wear that uh, deodorant. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, let's talk about that. That I stink? No. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of people, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there, there are still moments. My wife and I are about to uh, celebrate our 11th wedding anniversary, and there are still times where she doesn't quite get what I'm doing. Like, she'll 
walk into the studio, the home studio that I have, and I'll be watching a YouTube video. And she'll say, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. She goes, no, you're not. You're watching a YouTube video. I'm like, that's work. That's what I'm doing. You know, when you're sitting down in front of your computer and you're editing video, you're editing audio, you're sitting down, just kind of shooting the breeze with me. Uh, I'm sure there's situations like, hey, what are you doing? I'm working. I'm work- like, this is this is my work. This is this is what I do. And a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around that. It's it's the pre. It's the you see the guys on the ice, you know, playing in, in the National Hockey League on, you know, on the big stage, shall we say, right? Or or going down to Binghamton, New York, playing there for, you know, game Motor City Rockers, Binghamton Blackbirds. But you don't see the warm-up before the game. You don't see the bus ride to get there, the workouts in the off season, all the training, everything that went into it. That is you doing that. Like all my editing is all self-taught trial and error or watching YouTube videos. I think my Photoshopping and my video editing is, I would say half of it is just watching YouTube tutorials, learning how to do stuff, learning how to you know do certain tricks and effects and I guess hack my way to a finished product, if you will. Dude, there are, I, I, I call it YouTube University. Honestly, if there's something that I do not know that I need to achieve, my wife says, hey, I need you to go X, Y, and Z outside because this isn't working and I don't have a clue what to do, I will go to YouTube. And I will have somebody walk me through it and I'll go, okay, I think I know what I'm doing. At least I have a better idea of what I'm doing. But the majority of this is a trial and error. And you're right, because what people are seeing is the finished product. And more often than not, I mean, like when, when I get a, a hamburger at a fast food joint, I don't see what's going on behind. Or if I get a meal from a restaurant, I don't see what's going on. I get the finished product. I don't, I don't understand all of the prep that goes into before the restaurant even opens and all the things that need to be made. The same idea when it comes to content creation. You're getting the finished product. You're not, sometimes it may take two hours. Sometimes it may take two days. We, you don't really know. And, and that's, that's where the biggest effort comes in. That's where the biggest effort comes in is all the behind the scenes stuff. It's all of the responding to people on Patreon. It's all uh, getting the, the logos designed. It's getting the intro made. It's getting the hockey cards designed. It's getting the hockey cards delivered. It's getting the hockey card signed. It's getting the hockey cards mailed out. All those things really come to a culmination on why you have been able to make this a secondary career. And I, I want, really want to make that clear. The amount, the amount of effort you put in is what you're going to get out of it. It's like anything else. And back to your story about how you may not be the, the greatest hockey player talent-wise, but you're a hard worker. Most coaches will take a hard worker over somebody with talent who's lazy because you can, you can teach skill. You can't teach work ethic. You can't, you can't teach a guy how to want it. If, if a guy wants it bad enough, he'll do anything that you ask him to do within reason. And he, at the end of the day, I do believe he will go and accomplish that goal. A guy who's kind of, you know, half foot in the door, half out, you're never going to get what you actually want out of the guy because he's not in it. He's, his heart's not invested. He doesn't have the desire, the want. He's not driven enough. It's just as, as simple as that. One thing I did want to mention, though, you mentioned this right off the top of the show, was uh, radio influencing podcasting, vice versa, television. Have you noticed that I would say probably 2016, 2019-ish with all of these like big vloggers using these over-the-top thumbnails, clickbait titles, sensationalistic headlines, it's made its way into the mainstream media where you see that on every uh, broadcast, every news article. Like it's everywhere, the sensationalistic borderline clickbait stuff. Oh, absolutely. Everything. Everything is clickbait these days. There are times where I will, will I, I don't want to say fall for it because if, if the headline does grab me, not necessarily what the headline says, but if it's content that I'm interested in learning about, I'll click on it. And more often than not, shouldn't say more often than not, a lot of times I'll click on it and it's not even that article. They just take you to their website so you can see an ad and they get the click behind that. And that's, that's really frustrating because there are people out there that just are about, no, no, just get eyes on the product, eyes on the product, do whatever you can to try and get eyes on the product. And they just care about the clicks. They care about how many clicks they are. And we care about the clicks too. We care about the numbers. We see the numbers. We sell based on those numbers. But like you said, it's that trust. It's that trust. And a lot of times when I get one of those, I will go to my phone and I'll go, don't show me any more articles from this website. I am not interested in supporting that kind of clickbait funding. I'm really not a fan of it. I want to ask you, in total per week, and separate it for me as far as what you do for hockey and then what you do for the vlogs and the podcast, the amount of hours that you put in. Okay, so right now, let's just go to the off-season version. So I skate once a week, so it's an hour skate. I get to the rink usually two hours before. I transit there an hour. I transit there back. So let's just say that's a five-hour commitment to go skate. A lot of that's self-induced. But so five hours there. Uh, I work out twice a week with my trainer, and that is a, an hour and a half session. I usually do an hour of my mobility routine before then, so that's two and a half hours there. And then a commute there is about an hour and a half both ways, so that's three. So that's about six hours-ish, so 12 hours a week uh, just to do my workouts. Again, keep in mind the transit time is self-induced. As far as the editing goes, 
every vlog you see probably gets at least eight hours plus of editing by the time, you know, like the, the rough chop, setting everything up, the titles, the color corrections, the transitions, the just making everything tight and right, exporting the, uh, the thumbnail, the TikTok clips of that episode, eight hours plus probably on every single episode. Even the, the Banff and Jasper video uh, posted recently, it's only an eight minute video. That was probably like, I, I sat down and start to finish to edit that one. That was about 12 hours, maybe like a 13 hour, like start to finish, get everything done from nothing. So like there's, there's a good amount of time in that than the podcast itself. I would say it's about three to four hours a week. Like after we record this episode, I'll sit down, chop it up, uh, do the TikTok clips, the Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, and that's about four hours. And then I would say don't include the exporting time because that's about three and a half, four hours. But I, I do other stuff when that happens. So, um, so yeah, if you want to chalk that up. So yeah, four hours in the podcast. Uh, I don't know. Let's say 10 hours a week to get the vlog done. That's 14. The working out is 12. So that's 26. Skating. So I don't know, like 35 plus hours a week on just purely doing stuff, let alone eating, living, and, you know, bathroom breaks. So you're, you're a 40 hour plus a week guy, but you're not really logging those hours and you're not punching a clock. I, I would say so. And I don't look at it as uh, work, like punching a clock. The second you look at it as, oh, I got to start at this time and finish that time. Like it, it's done because this is all fueled by creativity and, and the, the mental desire to create this end product. Like I want to create something really cool and get that passion across to people, which is really hard sometimes to get it out, but it just... To, to me, a lot of these ideas just come to me. And when I get inspired, I start creating them. I start doing them. So that would be, I guess, the biggest thing. I think that's kind of kept it going, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, I won't even get into my schedule, but I'll tell you, it starts at about uh, 10 to Sorry, 4 in the I morning. I should have asked. Dave, tell me no, what no, you're no. Dave. Tell, no, tell no, me what it, you're it, Dave. It starts at, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the Coles notes. It starts at about 10 to 4, and it doesn't stop until I go to bed at night. Because when you're a content creator, everything you do, everything you say, everything you hear, everything you interact with becomes an idea. Now, whether it gets developed into actual content or not is another thing. But every single thing you see, hear, or do at least enters your brain into how can I make this content? How can I turn this into something that people will want to watch, listen to, or ingest in whatever way? So every single one of my wake, and even when I'm sleeping, there's times I'll wake up and going, I had a great dream last night. How can I turn that into content? How can I turn this into a story that I can tell? Every single waking moment that, that, that I have is pushed towards how can I make this either part of the podcast part of my podcast, part of the other podcast I do, part of my radio show, whatever it is, it, it literally has to be what you want to do all the time, all the time. And the first waking moment Dave usually has in the morning is at 3.50 uh, a.m. on his way to work. There's me at the corner of his bed yelling, all right, fella, early and often, we're going. Ice is ready. We're going. It's time. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick Come story. When, when, my, when my wife and I, before we got married, we moved in together and... Um, I remember my alarm went off at 10 to 4, and I turned it off right away, and I'm sneaking out of bed. And she goes, oh, good morning. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You can go back to bed. You can go back to bed. She's like, no, I, I thought about it, and I'm going to get up the same time as you. That way we're on the same schedule. And I thought, oh, boy, this isn't going to work. It only lasted about two days, and then she slept through my alarm, and everything's been great since then. But it is a it is a different lifestyle. And although I'm not you know, working at Sinker Canada back in Fort McMurray, working 12-hour shifts and working night shifts and whatnot, and I'm not uh, chasing, you know, running an ambulance, it's a different kind of work. And I, I, I call it, it's not a lot of uh, physical labor, but w which you do in your job, obviously, but it's a lot of mental sweat. It is a lot of mental sweat and it completely takes over your life. And as long as you're okay with that, even my wife said, she goes, I realize that I am a radio mistress. She goes, your love is radio. And I, I, I am a very close second, but she, she understands that. Yeah, I would say my love is helping people, playing hockey, sharing a vision, sharing a creativity. And, and ultimately, like if you have a question, you know, you want me to answer, leave it in the comment section below on the podcast and the video version. If you're on the audio version, maybe send me a Instagram message or whatnot, even for Dave too. Like I, I got one. What, what are you, what are your, some, outside of, outside of, you know, the frustrations of, you know, sometimes you, you have a time restraint or you can't get something up when uh, you have to go to practice or whatnot. What are some of the biggest frustrations you have as a content creator? Hmm. I would say technology not working. Like when I'm trying to export a video and maybe something's like there's a file missing, that's pretty annoying. Uh, when YouTube is the ultimate decider of if a podcast does well or if a vlog does well, like at the end of the day, every podcast we post is usually 60% plus not subscribed to the channel. So it's like, well, that like YouTube is hitting a certain threshold and then they stop putting the video out in front of people. And same with the vlog as well. So that's frustrating. I think also like my health is the number one um, contributor to my, you know, vlog success. Like if I'm not healthy and I'm not skating, the vlog dies, right? Like when I'm healthy and I'm playing, it's doing well. So that's a little bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that's, that's what I signed up for though. Like I signed up to 
share my love for hockey, share my love for video editing, sharing these creations, helping people, whether that's through you know eating shit myself or telling people about that. Um, but that's that's what I signed up for. And it's what I love doing. I, I wouldn't well, trade it for the world. Well, one of the reasons you got me is to make sure that we stay on time and to make sure we stay on point. And I think we followed your formula of Nirvana. We started quiet. We went loud. We went quiet. We hit a bridge and we finished loud. And I think it's time to wrap it up. Travis Ridgen, Slang in the Biscuit podcast. And it is. But one final thing to mention before we cap off here, uh, the Collector Series cards, just for the patron members. Uh, if you're not a patron member, again, you can join for five bucks a month. But there's going to be a six-piece collector set. So there's going to be two cards, uh, the old cards from Varberg and Motor City, as well as a brand new four-piece from uh, my junior days in Arberg, Lundar, VIU uh, at college, and then my first year Sweden Pro in Flemingsburg. So that six-piece set is going to be free for all the $10 a month members. If you're a $5 a month member, you just get the two cards. If you're a $10, you get all six. And if you're a $20 a month uh, Patreon member, you're getting the holographic printed collector's edition. There's only going to be uh, 250 of these printed. Uh, from a card from my Motor City days, a card from my Via or my Varberg days, which you're going to see on the screen of the video version. They're really crisp, by the way, Dave. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. No, they are they are minty. I mean, I, as a former hockey card collector, those are those are the, the reminiscent of the old Upper Deck days back in the mid-90s. And now the, you're going to notice this. So there's two holographic cards, but I'm selling three, or there's going to be a third in there for the $20 members. It's because unless something changes between recording this episode and going up, when I sign with my new team for next season, it's going to be a brand new card with my mug shot and the team logo to finish up the three-piece set. Again, 20 bucks a month will get you all the cards. 10 bucks a month will get you only the six-piece set. And then 5 bucks a month will only get you the uh, two Varberg and uh, Motor City cards. But if you want to join, again, that's linked in the video description for the Patreon page. You get merch. We do a podcast-exclusive episode every uh, month or Patreon exclusive episode every month and uh, yeah I hope everybody enjoyed this episode talking about uh, I guess the behind the scenes the Trav masterclass of you know the vlog the podcast and the inner workings of I guess how to make money on YouTube and how this has become a, a full-time thing for me my amazing co-host Mr. Dave Wheeler he has the number one morning show in the city of Winnipeg Energy 106 we in the morning and this podcast is impossible without him keeping the train on the tracks which was evident from the lack of success in the previous version and I guess we look forward to seeing you uh, next Sunday, as we always do. Dave, do you have any comments to close? Last piece of advice, and this comes down to your taxes. Find a charity that you love and support the heck out of them. And don't eat yellow snow. You'll regret that. <laughs>